Hello, welcome to one of the video recaps of the course. I don't know if this will happen every week, but after each lecture set, I'll try to do one of these. So that way, if you missed class or you want to refer to something back that we talked about, you have this video to go with it. So I won't cover all the slides in as much detail as in class, and I won't really talk, well, I'll talk through the solutions to the practice questions, but you know, if you want to do them yourself at home, pause the video and do all that stuff yourself. So we started this week with a little icebreaker. What is the difference between good writing and great writing? People came up with some answers for that. We'll talk about that again later. So then we went over the syllabus, which is you know all the stuff we're gonna do in the course. So for the course goals, one of the main goals I have for you is to practice these core writing concepts in linguistics. That's one of the most important things for the course is that by the end, although writing might not be a painless experience because Let's be real, for most of us, academic writing is not the most enjoyable thing, but at the very least, by the end of the course, you will be comfortable writing. You will know how to write. So the entire process where you sit down, brainstorm, do an outline, get to a final draft, uh, that will be covered in the course. So you will be a good writer by the end, hopefully. Uh, we're also going to do some side things like exploring linguistic concepts. Of course, this is writing for linguistics. So everything we do in the course will have some tie in to linguistics in the end, but that's not like the main focus. The main focus is writing. Um, we'll also do some other useful things for you. So practical things like understanding the research loop that includes starting with an idea and going to a conference to present your findings and getting feedback. So that's something a grad student will do in any discipline, pretty much. Um, also, we'll do some basic statistical stuff. It's a Q course throw that in there. Uh, it's not something that's ever explicitly covered in any other course in the department. So I figure what better way to do it than in a 282. So I'm Trevor. I have office hours RCB 9212 on Wednesdays, Fridays after class at one o'clock for an hour and a half. Uh, you can drop in any time. If those times don't work, you can make an appointment with me. Uh, so please email me 24 hours in advance and we can do that through Zoom. Uh, our TA is Magda. At the time of recording the video, I don't know where her office is yet, and her exact time, as far as I know, it is going to be 10.30 to 11.30 on Thursdays. I don't know yet if this is going to be in person or on Zoom, but please check Canvas. Um, that information will be updated on the syllabus page on Canvas. So as far as grading in the course, there's three main things we're doing. We're doing participation. I, I say participation in quotes because it's not like most people expect participation to be. It's more like activity points. Uh, we'll do minor writing assignments, which are small assignments focused on particular linguistic skills, and then major assignments where we take everything we learned and we put it together into something more substantial. So the way that these participation points work is there are at least 55 points available and you just have to get 40 in order to get 100%. And you cannot go over 40, so as soon as you hit the 40, you can stop worrying about everything else or you can continue to rack them up just for fun. So we have the Linguistics Department Writing Center. This is outside of Link 282 and it's available to all linguistics and cognitive science students. Uh, there is a sign-up sheet online. I'll post a link on the syllabus page for that. So you can sign up, you can bring your work to them either a draft, a revised copy, a copy with feedback, maybe you don't know what to do for a final paper so you want to brainstorm, you can go see the Linguistics Department Writing Center for any of that stuff. And every time you visit, you'll get five points up to two visits for 10 points. Um, but you can visit as many times as you want. And they get really busy towards the end of the semester. So if you want the points and there's no time slots available at the end of the semester because other courses are using it or other people are using it, that's too bad. Please see them as early as possible. Uh, there'll be a lot of activities on Canvas and in class. So usually one to three points per week, maybe more. And you could cap out at 30 points for those. Um, you can do the Linguistics Research Participation System. So there's a site online where you can do experiments for the department. Or you can uh, write like a summary on a podcast or article summary, stuff like that. When you get two credits, you'll get 10 points for that or five per credit. And if you visit me or Megda's office hours at least once during the semester, you'll get five points. So the ideal way to do this is, of course, to get 
the in-class activity points, that'll be easy. Just show up and I mean, half of them are online anyway, so you don't even need to show up for those. And either checking out the Linguistics Department Writing Center or checking out one of our office hours. The research participation system takes a lot longer to actually earn those points in terms of the time you put in. And it's not really directly beneficial to the course, but being part of the department, I know how hard it is to get research participants. So I'm putting that in because it's just helpful in general to everybody. The minor writing assignments, there's six for a total of 30%, and these all focus on some skill. So the first one, you'll have to explain a linguistic concept in your own words. Uh, for number two, you'll be writing a data analysis of a morphology problem. And I think one of the last ones you do, number six, when we learn about statistics, you'll have to report statistics. I'll, I'll give you statistics in advance, but you'll have to put those together into a write-up. So you're not really doing a lot of the dirty work in a lot of these cases. It's more so I'm giving you stuff that's already completed or near completed or just really straightforward to complete. And then your focus is the writing aspect of it. The major assignments are bigger. So when we work on minor assignments, say two and three, we'll be doing analyses of small data sets. And for the first major writing assignment, you'll get a much larger set of data. So you'll get four different subparts and you'll have to take those and write them up into something coherent that explains a few things that go on in the language. After we finish talking about articles, you'll be summarizing an article and critiquing it. And for the final writing assignment is just a paper. It's a paper on a topic of your choice and it can be just linguistics or it can be inter interdisciplinary. You can do it by yourself, or you can maybe find a classmate that you're working well with throughout the semester and write it with them. So this can be anything. Uh, you could take a look at some grammatical pattern and investigate it on Twitter or a corpus or Facebook and see how it's used. You could use your own judgments. You could run a little experiment through Google Sheets. Um, if you're more of a creative type and you want to create a constructed language, so something fictional, something fun, uh, you could do that and you could give a complete documentation of the phonemes, uh, phonological rules, morphology of it. That could be one thing. Um, if you're into sociolinguistics or historical linguistics, forensic linguistics, computational linguistics, I mean anything, you can write a short literature review. So a bunch of information on what has been shown in the studies and uh, what you'd like to do with it if you have an experiment proposal or a question you want answered. And like I said, it can be interdisciplinary too. So I know that there's uh, quite a few people in cognitive science, some computing science people, some psychology people. If there's something in those disciplines that you enjoy and you can find some way to connect it to linguistics, you can do that. In fact, if you're in computing science, uh, you have tools like Python at your disposal that you could use to like mine a corpus or mine Twitter. And if that's something you're capable of doing, uh, we can even cut back some of the writing for you and make it so there's a split between the actual programming and methodology and then the writing itself. So depends what you do. Uh, I know you might look at this and be like, mathematics, what are you talking about math and linguistics? Well, mathematics is a big part of linguistics as some of you might see going into upper division courses like semantics or formal linguistics. Uh, linguistics and math are, linguistics, math, computing science, and psychology are just this happy bundle of disciplines that all interact with each other. It's pretty neat. You'll also have a chance to do revisions in this course. And I know that in a lot of writing courses, what will happen is you'll submit a draft, revise it, and then submit a final copy. Uh, we're doing this differently, and I'm pushing all of the revisions to the last month of the course. A couple reasons for this. The first reason is that I want you to have as much experience writing as possible before you do revisions, because that way revisions will be better than if you just looked at them right away and submitted them, because you get a lot more practice opportunity first. The second is because you're doing a final paper in the course, I want to make sure you're not doing too much new writing towards the end. So by putting the revisions in the last three weeks or so, these are going to be three weeks where you don't have to do any new writing. You can just revise old work. In fact, you might even want to revise it as you get the feedback and just hold it off till the end of the course until you submit it. 
There are restrictions on which ones you can submit. So the first revision will be one of the first three minor writing assignments. The second one will be a major writing assignment. And then the last revision will be one of the last three minor writing assignments. Um, mainly July 28th. So that way we have feedback for you guaranteed by that point for both writing assignments. And same with the August 4th case. Uh, we want to make sure that the feedback for four, five, and six are completely done. And we don't have to think twice about that. Uh, there will be a balance. So your original submission, sorry, that is a horrible yellow. The original submission will still have some weight in your overall score, but only about a third. And the revision will uh, take over about two thirds of that grade. So if you got a seven out of 10 on your original and 10 out of 10 on your revision, that would balance out to a nine out of 10 overall. And if you didn't submit an assignment earlier in the course, instead of revising something, you can also take the time to submit your assignment in those revision periods. So you can miss two minor writing assignments throughout the course or one major writing assignment throughout the course, and you can submit it during these revision dates. Um, you will ha have your score multiplied by 85%. So if you got 10 out of 10, that would go down to an 8.5 out of 10, um, just because you didn't submit it earlier. We have nothing to compare it to and to be fair for people who are submitting the revised version. There's some more information about grading and stuff on the syllabus page on Canvas, but to sum it up shortly, this course uses a mix of labor-based grading and assessment-based grading. What this means is that as long as you complete everything in the course, the lowest you can get is a C. I will not give a C minus D or F if you just happen to miss or, or if you complete everything. If you miss one or two things, there is some uh, steps that take you down, but the requirement is that you have a C at all for those to kick in. If you get an A and you've missed a minor writing assignment, I guess that'd be an A minus, uh, it's not going to hurt your grade other than the fact that you've lost it. Um, what else was there in the syllabus that's very important? Uh, right, the grading scale. The grading scale in linguistics is usually pretty harsh. Um, believe it or not, my grading scale is definitely not the harshest out there. Uh, it's every 4% is a letter grade. Typically, it's every 3.33, 3.5%. So an 80 is like a the minimum for a B minus normally. I don't know how the marking is going to go out in this course. Um, obviously, there are going to be differences between me and the TA. So we will find a way to adjust the grading scale if things are just not what they should be. I'm aware of what things are. I'm usually pretty generous with the grades I give out. So if you're looking and saying, wow, that scary 82% is like a B minus or something or a B, don't, don't freak out too much. Uh, the course average will probably be a B or B plus in the end, regardless of what the overall score is. So people will be scaled or the, uh, the grading scale will be adjusted to accommodate for that. The, the worst, the worst thing that can happen is you get grades that you don't deserve. And that's what we're trying to avoid at all costs. The, you should be getting a grade that you deserved based on, um, the understanding of your writing from me and the TA Magda. So what is writing? That's the first topic is the intro week. We're not going to do anything hard. We're just going to talk generally about writing. So writing has quite a few advantages over other modes of, you know, uh, communication. And I'm thinking about this academically. I'm not thinking about this in terms of storytelling, fiction, um, you know, like public speaking, not that kind of thing. This is about the academic setting with writing. We have the opportunity to review what we've written. Uh, while presenting, we might have a speech memorized, but it's not too often that we actually stay on that speech. Normally we ad lib, we create things as we go on, we say other things, we clarify things in the moment. And this contrast can lead to a few different things. Uh, one of them is ambiguity. If you're writing, you can look over your work and you can make sure that it's very clear what you're saying. When you say it is blah, 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 you can make sure that the readers know what it is. When you're speaking and you go off script, this is different because you're saying things from your mind, you're trying to put them into words. And sometimes the words that come out of your mouth are not as clear as the ideas in your head. So that's one advantage to writing. Uh, the other is the argumentation. Usually if we give a presentation, we're limited in time to 
20 minutes, 30 minutes, or 50 minutes. That's typically where we are. And if you have to give a presentation that is short, it is very difficult to get to all of the points that you're trying to make, which means that your audience is going to have some questions. But in writing, you can take the time to address all of those points. Uh, there might be a page limit or word limit that restricts you, but through some creative solutions, you can usually find a way to fit everything that you need to say in. Now, from the viewer's side, and a lot of you might have not been to academic conferences yet, but you've sat through lectures before, so you can relate to this. When you have to listen to someone, especially live, there is no time to go back and clarify things you've missed. You have to actually understand the presentation as they're going through the presentation, which is monumentally difficult in a lot of cases because they're talking about things that you don't fully understand. And what that leads to is this limitation in your judgments. You can't really critique an idea if you don't understand it. And in a presentation setting, you're probably not going to understand it well enough to actually make good critiques. You'll see people in audiences at academic conferences critique things all the time, and uh, they're, they're hit or miss. Papers, on the other hand, you can take as much time as you need to read these things. You can go back, you can highlight things, you can ask other people what they're trying to say. And that is a huge benefit because you can actually spend time understanding what's happening. And because of that, you can make some really good judgments, critiques, and analyses based on your understanding. Um, these are questions that you can bring to the person who wrote the paper and say, okay, you put in detail these facts, but I have research to suggest otherwise, so what is happening here? That can actually be done because you've had enough time to read things. And in fact, researchers are usually a lot more open to dialogue and discussion when the reader has actually gone through all the ideas and understood them carefully. So in general, when we talk about writing, we, we see there are some advantages, advantages there. And unfortunately, we have this common phrase here that is mostly true, and that's writing is an art, not a science. And for a lot of us, this is problematic because we want to be good writers or even great writers, but there's no clear step-by-step -step way to get there because it's just this creative medium. But there is a slight difference here. And that is that good writing isn't much of an art as it is a science. Good writing is, is very easy to define and it's very easy to note. So I say that good writing is pretty objective. Usually it means there's a good structure, the words that you use are being chosen and used correctly, your ideas that you're trying to communicate are clear, or at least they're all there for someone to understand if they want to take the time, and it's formatted in a good way. On the other hand, if you want to be a great writer, which is totally subjective, there are some other things that go on. Like, how well do your examples and explanations resonate to the, to the reader? Are the sentences you construct likable by the reader? Uh, sometimes subjectivity in writing is just about how well the reader understands your paper, and that's totally separate from how you wrote it. Maybe the content's difficult. So someone would say, oh, this isn't great writing because it's too hard to understand, but maybe it's just hard to understand. So in this course, what we're aiming for is Good writing, not great writing. I mean, if you can be a great writer, that's fantastic. But the reality is great writing takes decades of practice. Some people are naturals, but a lot of us aren't. So what we can work on with everybody is getting you to a level of good writing. What we can't do is take everyone to be great writers because that's subjective. If we think about fiction, uh, Jane Austen, is one of those writers who is renowned for being fantastic by many people in literature. I can't stand those books. I think the writing is horrible. I think it's boring. But that's me. That's just an opinion. Is the writing good? Yeah, it's good, but I don't think it's great. Well, other people would think it's great and have that contrast of opinion. So there's a lot of subjectivity in great writing, 
but good writing is pretty objective. I think we'd all agree that uh, Stephen King is a good writer. Uh, Jane Austen is a good writer. Uh, even for kids' books, R.L. Stein, good writer, not great, but good. And we can usually all agree on that. We, we know bad writing from good writing. So the first activity that we did on Friday's lecture was reading this paragraph and asking if it was good or great. And uh, it's at least good. So the degree of selection between the clitics and the words preceding them is low. The clitics can attach the words of virtually any category in addition to pronouns in 1A to B. List some examples. The inflectional affixes by contrast are quite specific in their selections of stems. The plural affixes only attach to noun stems, pass to verbs, and superlatives to adjectives and adverbs. That was fast, but it's on the page. So the reason I say that this is at least good is it's because it has a very nice opening sentence. You know exactly what's being discussed. You have examples that tie it into that sentence, and the end makes a contrast. Although the end doesn't actually show any of this, uh, I don't remember if this is for space limitations or if it just wasn't in the actual paper itself. It's been a while. But it still shows you everything that you would want to know from whatever they're talking about here, which is uh, clitics. Uh, just to talk about what a clitic is quickly. A clitic is like the thing... Oh, that is a horrible color. A clitic is like a thing that attaches with an apostrophe to the end of a word. If I'm putting it very simply, so the mm in I'm or the nt in can't, well, in, in a different course, you'll find that this is a special case. But this is just a, a nice, concise way to talk about clitics. While inflectional affixes would be something like the S in cats. Okay, so it's at least good. Do I think this is great? Kind of. It's kind of great. Um, the writing is really concise, but with the examples, I wish there were some... Uh, boxes or underlines or something that highlighted where this clitic was uh, in order to connect it to these adverbs. So I think that could have been better. Um, but as far as that goes, it's really hard to evaluate great writing in just one paragraph, right? But it's at least good. So the next thing we talked about was prescriptivism, and in Ling 220 or any intro course, it's usually linguists or descriptivists. Prescriptivism is terrible and bad and evil. And in the context of linguistics, yeah, we don't want to be prescriptivists. We want to be descriptive because we're trying to analyze language and find out truths. But when we talk about writing, we need to have some level of prescriptivism. Otherwise, we are going to write like text messages, perhaps which would be confusing for a good majority of people out there. So, for example, some prescriptivism or some prescriptive rules that we follow is don't use double negatives. So don't use no double negatives. Uh, be careful with your word choice. So we wouldn't say zoomers, boomers. We wouldn't be creative and say under get instead of understand. Uh, the word ain't is non-standard, so we would avoid that. If we're formatting things, we're consistent. And if we're writing a paper, we're looking at other papers to see how they format things. So there's some consistency across all papers, which is beneficial to everybody, really. So some prescriptivism is okay. And the specific ones we care about are going to relate to structure, grammar, vocabulary choice, and formatting. So we can see some of the things here. Uh, with paper structure, basically, we follow the same structures as other papers. We have intro, conclusion at the end, uh, body in the middle. If we're talking about our contributions, we're putting them later in the paper. If we have examples we want to introduce, we're introducing them where they're relevant and not way later in the paper. In terms of our grammar and vocabulary choice, you know, if we have a term like phoneme and phone, we're using those correctly. We're not saying like, uh, we're not referring to like a syllable throughout the paper as a cluster of sounds. We're saying syllable because we know what those mean. Uh, usually we want few typos or errors. Everyone makes typos, that's normal, but we want to minimize those as much as possible. If you're a second language English speaker, of course you're going to make errors that's understandable. In the real world, what you do is you give it to your colleague and you say, please edit my paper, and they say, okay, you owe me one. So if you make some second language errors in the course, we're just going to overlook those. But proper use of vocabulary 
and typos are a different story. So we know what L2 English errors look like, agreement issues, plural issues, things like that, but typos and word choice are, are a separate topic. Now, formatting is also really important. So a lot of linguistic specific stuff that will show over the semester, either in class or online through Canvas exercises. So one of the main ones is like references. Usually you follow some general guide like APA, Chicago, MLA, but a lot of cases, journals like language or Glossa or Lingua, these are academic journals. They have their own specific style guides. So it's about adapting your writing to fit those style guides. And to be honest, normally you write the paper first, then check their style guides and then format it later. And the, ex the examples, trees and diagrams what we'll see as we go throughout the course. So the next activity was talking about the goals of different papers. So usually the goal for us as students is we're writing the paper because we need to, to get a grade. But that's, that's an objective for you. That's not an objective of the paper. So each of these different types of papers has a different objective. So for instance, with a term paper, what you're normally looking at with a term paper is to show, I'll try to write neatly for this, show your prof you understand material. That's usually what it's for. Uh, either understanding material or being able to think about it on your own. You don't write a term paper for anyone but a professor usually. A research article, of course, is to introduce findings to the field and to argue for them. So introduce findings and evidence. It's a slightly different goal than a term paper. Uh, a reflection paper, if you haven't done it, uh, usually you see these in education more than anywhere else, but you talk about something and you relate it to your own personal experience. So this is really to mix uh, theory and uh, personal experience. So how does the course material relate to your own life? What do you learn from it? What are your insights? And finally, lecture slides. Uh, lecture slides are very interesting because the main goal is to teach students. It's to give them some sort of uh, rail track from topic to topic to topic to topic. Uh, maybe taking some sidesteps, some detours, but essentially you're guiding them through how to learn something, which is very different from say a conference presentation or a term paper. So each of these have slightly different goals of objective is purposes, whatever word you want to use there. But they do share one thing in common. No matter what type of writing you're doing, you're trying to communicate information to people who don't know that information. So if we take a look at these with a the term paper, you're trying to communicate information about yourself that the professor doesn't know. He doesn't, uh, he or she, I'll just use gender neutral, they, they don't know how much you actually understand, how much you're able to research and come up with your own findings and synthesize. You're trying to communicate that information indirectly through your writing. With a research article, you're introducing something new to the field with arguments. You're trying to introduce that new information to everyone else in the field. Reflection papers. Your instructor doesn't know about your personal experiences, so you're trying to communicate that information to them. Lecture slides is probably the best example of this because you're trying to teach people new things. So you're communicating new information to them. So no matter what type of writing you do, we have this underlying principle of communicating information to other people. And this is the most important thing to keep in mind because you're trying to make your writing in academic writing as easy to understand and simple as possible. When I say as possible, what I mean here is by not taking away a lot of the intricacies of the discipline. So we could make the term syllable simpler by saying a group of sounds, but that takes away some of the rigor of linguistics. So we don't wanna do that, but we wanna make sure our explanations are clear, our examples are clear, and it's easy to follow along. So try to keep these questions in mind. Like who is reading this and will they understand it? Is it clear? So are your ideas clear? Are the thoughts in your head getting onto paper exactly how you want them presented? And is it a straightforward read? Now this, this last one isn't 
always easy to accomplish because some things are just difficult, but this is about really the structure of the paper. Is it easy to read from beginning to end, ignoring the difficulty of the content inside the paper? So what I wanna do for this example, and I have this filled out on the slides already, but in class, of course, we, we actually go through this process, is to think about explaining a linguistic concept in our own terms. So let's say we want to explain how voicing works with sounds. And we want specifically to describe how these sounds are made and what they look like. So we can ask ourselves a few questions to start. Like, what do we know about voicing in general? And what's important when we talk about voicing? Like, there's a lot of irrelevant things we can talk about, but what are the main points? And whenever you do anything in writing, you want to brainstorm, either writing down things on paper, keeping it in your head, doing an outline, talking to someone. It's just really important to use your words out of your mouth to make sure that what you're saying is going to make sense. So I have some stuff filled out. Um, I'll just keep this up as I talk about things. So when we think about voicing, there's a couple things we might think about. One is like our throat. So what is our throat doing? The other is examples of sounds. Uh, maybe you want to talk about uh, contrast between languages. So some languages do have voice sounds, others don't. So first to get an understanding of what you're writing, it's really good to actually know you understand things. So uh, as an example, when we talk about voicing, what's really happening with voicing? So t versus d. Well, I have some pictures of the vocal folds here. This is from the Ling220 textbook, Contemporary Linguistic Analysis. And I want to specifically focus on these folds right here. So think about a guitar string. If the guitar string is very loose and you try to pluck the guitar string, how much vibration do you get? Well, you don't get any, it's loose. But what if you tighten that guitar string and then try to pluck it? Well, then you get these vibrations going up and down, right? So this is what's happening in your throat when you are trying to produce voiceless or voice sounds. When it's voiceless, we have these things here called the arytenoid cartilages. So these little triangle-like things here. And when you produce a voiceless sound, they're more towards the center of your throat which causes these vocal folds to be loose. So when air goes through and they're vibrating the vocal folds, you don't really get any vibration because these strings are loose. When you do a voice sound, these arytenoid cartilages come more towards the front. So it tightens up those vocal folds. So then when air tries to go out through uh, your vocal folds there, they're tight, they're tight together. So air is going to hit them and cause vibrations as air leaves through you know, your, your oral cavity, causing that vibration, which gives you those voice sounds. So that's the understanding of what's going on physically. In terms of actual language, we might give some examples. So voiceless sounds are p or p, t, k, s, f. And voice sounds are b, d, g, z, v, z. E, A, U, and so on. Uh, we have some side detail that sounds can also be whispers or murmurs, but we're not talking about that. We're talking about voicing. Uh, here is a nice piece of information about how you can feel this. So if you put your hands on your throat here, don't squeeze too hard. You might discover something. Uh, when you do s, you're not gonna feel any vibrations, but when you go zzz, you'll feel vibrations. So you can actually feel your vocal folds doing it uh, from the outside of your throat. And then again, another piece of side information about um, language variation. So when I think about explaining voicing, you, I ask myself, what's the most important thing? And the most important thing is just understanding how it works and how we can tie that in with a real example so that way, you know, the reader can actually do something physical or see something and understand that connection. So if they don't understand the explanation, at least they can see some examples and try to extrapolate information from that. So 
This piece of information here about the arytenoid cartilages, very important. Um, examples are also going to be important. And we should probably do examples in terms of real words. So maybe you think of a word like pig, which has a voiceless first consonant and a voiced last consonant. Or maybe you want to contrast, say, cats and dogs, where uh, that should be an S2, where you have the same letter, but each of these are going to be different sounds. Uh, and this isn't quite correct. In reality, these actually become uh, affricates in those positions. Well, specifically the TS. But, you know, roughly speaking, we know there's a difference between cats and dogs. So here's uh, some questions about that. So when you explain voicing, what's the goal? Who's our audience? What terms? What examples? How should we structure our explanation? Um, I won't really talk about that since I think we can get a, get most of it from the previous slide. You know, what's the goal? Explain voicing, give examples. Who's our audience? In this case, probably someone new to linguistics. What terms do we need to define? Uh, obviously, you have to define voiceless and voiced if we're talking about voicing. Um, examples, yeah, probably a couple examples of voiceless sounds. So usually VLS means voiceless and VD means voiced. So maybe we want the term cats and tulip. And maybe for voice, we want dogs and zebra. I'm sort of borrowing words from the next slide if you haven't seen that yet. And how should we structure explanation? Well, we should probably do a uh, theory of how it works, so we introduce it, and then we do examples. And maybe we want to do uh, voiceless theory, voiceless examples, voice theory, voiced examples. Maybe that's one way we want to do it. Or maybe we want to do uh, voiceless theory and voice theory, and then do examples of both. So we have some ways that we could Pick how this works. Sorry for the slide of writing here. But we have options. So what I have here is a sample writing for how this works. Uh, it's scary. I got the words exactly right when I haven't looked at this in a few days. Um, OK, so here's the sample. Most sounds produced by humans are either voiceless or voiced. With voiceless sounds, your vocal folds do not vibrate as air flows from the lungs to the larynx. Some examples of voiceless sounds are the final S in cats or the initial T in tulip. Okay, so what do we do here? Uh, we did voiceless theory, and then we finished off with voiceless examples. Okay, now we go on to voice sounds, however, will produce vibrations in the vocal folds as air flows out of the lungs. This occurs when the arytenoid cartilages at the front of your larynx come close together, tightening the vocal folds and causing vibrations as air tries to escape through the glottis. Okay, this is a long sentence, but this is very straightforward. It explains exactly what is going on. And what I like about this, of course, is the actual terms. So vocal folds, uh, glottis, arytenoid cartilages, and including a picture here in the middle of this would actually be very helpful. Uh, and then some examples of voice sounds are the initial D and dri, initial D and drill, then the final S in dogs, which is pronounced like the Z in zebra rather than the final S in cats. Okay, so something else that's nice here is we use the same S as we did before, the final S in cats, the final S in dogs, but we make a contrast. And this contrast will help the reader understand just by hearing the words or feeling their throat. Notice we don't have anything about feeling your throat, but that could be added in. Now, how good is this paragraph? It's good. Is it great? Depends on who reads it. Uh, as far as an intro explanation, a quick summary, it's, yeah, it's pretty good. It could be a little bit more detailed. It could have pictures. Uh, I don't particularly like this beginning with the voiceless sounds. I think that's a little odd. Uh, you could say in producing voiceless sounds. Uh, I do like the examples quite a bit, um, but this sentence about the arytenoid cartilages could really use a picture, and that would make this, I think, a much greater piece of writing. And I know I'm being really nitpicky here, but, um, you know, we're trying to be as nitpicky as possible in the beginning to just understand where things can be improved. Because every piece of writing can be improved. 
almost every piece of writing, it just depends who you talk to, right? So do I think it's personally great? I've seen a lot greater, but this is, this is a very solid paragraph, like a very solid paragraph. So some easy things that, you know, we saw some, so, we saw some things that made this really easy to read. Of course, this is a lot of subjective, uh, a lot of subjective opinion here, but these are the things I liked about it. Uh, one thing I really like is that it's short. The, ex the examples are not over-explained. Nothing is over-explained. It's explained and then they just cut it and go to something else. And I like that. I don't like reading a lot of extra stuff, uh, flowery stuff, side information that's not relevant because it just makes the whole thing harder to understand. The formatting is consistent. As we saw here with letters, we put them all in these angular brackets. So normally the letters have angular brackets. Um, if you use the quotation marks, normally you're giving translations. The square brackets are for phones and the slanty brackets are for phonemes. And we'll talk about specifically what these are in week three. Uh, one thing I like is it's straight to the point. A lot of you in your writing so far, in your previous courses, I'm making assumptions here, but just based on what I've seen in the Writing Center for the past two and a half years, a lot of people start with these really vague openers, like something like, in this case, it would be humans produce a lot of different sounds. Now, that is a useless sentence in terms of what we're trying to explain. Like, yes, that is a true statement. And it is an opener in some cases, in some departments that would be accepted. In linguistics, it's more so why are you wasting your topic sentence saying nothing of importance? This one, most sounds produced by humans are either voiceless or voiced. It's short as well, but it's more direct and explicit about what we're talking about. So it is obvious from the very first sentence that we are going to talk about voiceless versus voice sounds. If you just say humans produce a lot of different sounds, we have no idea what we're talking about specifically here. If it were a general topic, sure, maybe that's appropriate. But this is not general. This is not about general sounds. This is specifically about voicelessness and voicing. So uh, that's why I like this intro a lot. And finally, the definitions aren't copy-pasted. Now, this is something that everyone struggles with because copying definitions is plagiarism. And sometimes you think, well, how do I explain something like this in my own words? Especially when you don't really know that much about it. And that is a very hard task. But again, the idea is you take notes on something, you try to explain it in words to yourself, and once you come up with the words to explain it with yourself, you can write those down. So I don't know what any textbook says about voicelessness or voicing. Like genuinely, I've forgotten what any textbook definition gives for these because my understanding is just the process. I understand the physical aspect of it and then I take that into writing. So that happens because I've been in linguistics for 11 years and I've been doing phonetics for, uh, well, teaching phonetics or learning about phonetics and phonology for like 10 years of that. So that's why I can do that pretty quickly. Um, for you with new concepts, it's gonna take a lot longer. So just don't copy paste, but you can definitely use other explanations, definitions, examples as, um, as inspiration, as, as a guide for how you can explain things. So that was it for the first week of material. Again, pretty, just quick introductory stuff. And your first minor writing assignment is due next Thursday. So that is, let's see, May 11th is the first, so May 19th. And it's due 11.59 p.m. And your first task is going to be to explain a linguistic concept in your own words. And I've given you resources for any of the possible topics that you want. So we're doing this because to write anything in linguistics, you have to define a term or two. You have to be able to explain something, whether it's a finding, whether it's a definition, whether it's a process, we have to be able to explain it in writing. So that is the goal this week. So you'll be able to select one of these topics uh, from the list of eight, 
So just write about the one that you find easiest. Don't challenge yourself too much. This isn't a challenge of understanding your linguistic ability for the first writing assignment. It is an understanding of your writing. So pick the thing you're strongest with. And on the actual paper, there's a little resource button here that I've removed on this slide because it, it clutters things up. So you can pick the one that you like and your explanation should include the concept itself, uh, why it's important can be a very small part of it, your own definition of these terms. So again, you can use definitions in textbooks for inspiration, but please don't copy paste them. Uh, examples, whether that's a picture or whether that's a word, like in the example we saw in voicing, we saw words like cats and dogs and zebra and drill. Those are examples. And then of course, explaining those examples. In some cases, it's harder than others, but let's say you're talking about free and bound morphemes and you talk about the word uh, runs. You can say run has uh, the bound morpheme run and the free, sorry, run has the free morpheme. Let me restart that one more time. Runs has the free morpheme run and the bound morpheme z. Uh, run is free because it can stand alone as a word while the uh, third person agreement s is bound because it cannot stand on its own. So that's a way to explain it. And I think I just, well, I think I just made that first one a lot easier to write about than the other. But anyway, that's not really the point here. Uh, that's it for the first week. And as always, if you have questions, you can go on Discord, ask me there, email Canvas Discussion Board, see me in office hours, see Magda. If you want feedback on your writing, you can see me, Magda, or you can go to the Linguistics Department Writing Center. So it opens in week two, not week one, but all of those are available for you. So see you next week.